And they do say, gentlemen, that out in Oregon, the pigs are running around under acorn trees, round and fat, and already cooked with knives and forks sticking in them, so that you can cut off a slice whenever you're hungry. Brothers and sisters, there are heathen right here in North America that need Christianizing. They have red skin and black hair, and they live... I say 5440 or fight. The rich land bordering the Pacific Ocean does not belong to England. It is this nation's manifest destiny. As early as 1830, wagon wheels began to roll northwest. Fur traders pushed, pulled, and cursed their wagons across what they called the Great American Desert to the foot of the Rocky Mountains. Then came zealous missionaries, ordained to bring the red-skinned savages of Oregon into the fold of Christianity. In the 1840s, their trails into Oregon territory were further pioneered by those who tilled the land. Sodbusters, spurred by a big drop in farm prices and the lure of cheap land in Oregon. By the 1850s, the trickle had become a flood. Pouring out of the waters of the Missouri, a multitude of saints pursuing a new Jerusalem shared the same forbidding landscape with those seeking their fortune at the end of a swinging ax. Others went west for simpler reasons. One individual remarked that he was going because the thing wasn't fenced in and nobody dared keep him off. Whatever their reasons for going, the path they followed was generally the same. It was a 2,000 mile stretch of dirt and rock and mud called the Oregon Trail. Big Muddy, the wild Missouri. In late March and early April, this river came alive with steamboats. Starting at St. Louis, they carried emigrants by the thousands and cargo by the tons upriver to what were rightly called the jumping off places. Independence and Westport, old border towns on the Santa Fe Trail. As time passed, Towns further upriver became points of departure. Weston, St. Joseph, and Council Bluffs, Iowa. However, for the first migrations, independence was the hub. Animals, provisions, and everything for complete equipment are to be obtained in abundance and on the most liberal terms in this country. During one period, 47 blacksmith shops resounded with the incessant ring of anvil and hammer. Oxen are cheaper and more substantial over the long haul. Yeah, but mules are faster and stand the heat better. Five months for oxen in a wet year. Four months with mules in a good driveway. Into a small oblong box with a high canvas top went the sum total of their earthly possessions. When the yellow-brown grass of winter turned green and measured four inches, long enough for stock to graze, it was time to hit the trail. As pioneers left plowed ground and civilization behind, some were tight-lipped and grim, while others whistled as though their mouth had been made for nothing else. The Oregon Trail followed the Santa Fe Trail past the Missouri border. Approximately three days out of independence, the trail split. A lone sign pointed the way to Oregon. Surely, one historian remarked, so humble a sign never before or since announced so long a journey. 
The first landmark that excited interest was a large bump on the prairie called Blue Mound. Skylarking emigrants rushed to the top of the hill, causing the experienced wagon master to roar at the green horns. How long before the snow flies in the Blue Mountains? How many days to get there? Get down that hill and get going or you'll freeze to death in the Oregon snow! After 1845, the treacherous Kansas River was crossed by flat-bottomed ferry. Weren't bad. Those fellers only wanted a dollar a wagon. That was in May of 1849. Later that same year, the gold rush inflated prices to $4 a wagon, two bits a mule, and a dime a man. After crossing the Kansas, it was customary to choose company leaders. At a, at a given signal, the candidates marched out across the prairie. And then all the other men began chasing them lickety-split. Each man lined up behind his favorite so that every candidate had a sort of tail of his own. The men with the longest tails were elected. <laughs> that was really running for office. Prairie flowers are beautiful beyond all description. Wildflowers can be seen for miles. Thousands of small flowers with delicate blossoms and great variety in color spring up everywhere, like sweet emotions that sometimes come to the most desolate heart. The birth and bloom of the prairie flower was, in part, triggered by a phenomenon totally unfamiliar to those from the Atlantic coast, the prairie thunderstorm. Towards sunset, the storm ceased as suddenly as it began. Yet scarcely had the night set in when the tumult broke forth anew. Lightning flashed all night, and the long roll and peal of thunder crashed and echoed over the boundless prairie. We came to a spring of water as pure and cold as if it had been melted from us. It gushed from a ledge of rocks falling some 10 or 12 feet. Altogether, it was one of the most romantic spots I ever saw. And we named it Alcove Springs, and future travelers will find the name carved on rocks nearby. After crossing the Big Blue, the trail followed the Valley of the Little Blue. There was plenty of grass and plenty of wood. For a while, the whole thing looked like a big picnic. From the Little Blue, it was a short distance to the broad, silvery Platte. A mile wide and an inch deep, some said. Others, noting the muddy surface, claimed it flowed bottom side up. Constructed in 1848, Fort Kearney was the first fort built to protect wagon trains. During one peak period, 800 wagons and 10,000 oxen passed through the fort in one day. The Great Medicine Road, Indians called it that as they watched the endless procession of white-topped prairie schooners. Until the late 1850s, the red man proved only a mild threat, petty thievery, or an occasional scalp. Most confrontations were resolved peacefully with an exchange of gifts. Only when treaties were broken, when their staff of life was slaughtered wholesale, when white man's diseases ravaged their tribes, and when white settlements began to infringe upon their rightful domain, only then did Indian troubles really begin. They lasted as long as there were Indians along the trail. Further west along the Platte, curious-looking sand hills rose up on both sides of the river. 
whimsically referred to as the coast of Nebraska, these hills often rumbled with the low sound of distant thunder. The earth began to quake all around as a herd of shaggy beasts rumbled by in their clumsy rolling gait. The buffalo hunt, considered great sport, was an almost daily occurrence from the Platte to the Continental Divide. The meat of the buffalo was the daily bread of the traveler. Though some preferred the tongue and others the hump, all parts were excellent food. Sometimes the tough hide was used to make boots for the oxen, that protected their hooves from the parched sandy ground. Yeah, and what's more, buffalo chips made a good cook fire when you couldn't get wood. A lot of folks wouldn't believe them chips would burn longer than wood and didn't have no odor till they tried it themselves. Shortly after crossing the South Platte, the trail ascended a broad ridge. This change was a welcome relief from the sameness and monotony of the Platte River Road, but relief turned to suspense as steep, narrow ravines climaxed at Windless Hill, a point where some swore the road hung just a little past the perpendicular. Goods were unloaded, wheels locked, ropes came out. Fortunately, at the bottom, gentle hills led to the North Platte and Ash Hollow, where a delightful grove of ash and cedar trees provided a perfect spot for weary travelers to rest and make repair. After the music quit, the dancers disappeared, and perhaps a love-struck lad would whisper a tender good night in the ear of a blushing maiden, or steal a kiss from the lips of some future bride. Yes, sir, every morning at 4 a.m. the guards on duty fired their rifles. Women and children prepared breakfast while the men folk struck tents and rounded up animals. At seven, the signal to march would sound, and the caravan would draw its lazy length into formation. Each day, the same routine, the same goal, 20 miles. 20 miles? <laughs> More like 15, usually less. Courthouse Rock and its small neighbor, Jail Rock, were portals to a new and distinct region a place where rocks and hills aroused poetic fantasies in letters and diaries. A strangely eroded spire reared up out of the prairie like a giant storm-shattered tree trunk. Chimney Rock resembled... A, a haystack with a pole sticking out its top. An open umbrella. A church steeple. A big sweet potato hill with a pile of rocks on top. And then... Scott's Bluff, the Gibraltar of the plains. It was compared to the Tower of Babel, to a Persian temple, and to the ancient ruins of some vast city erected by a race of giants. Fort Laramie, 640 miles from Independence. Originally an American fur trading post. Purchased by the government in 1849 and garrisoned with troops, it provided a primitive link with the United States. A seldom used guardhouse stood as a solitary symbol of justice in a country where law and order were precarious ideals. The real prison, however, was the close living quarters of the wagon train. This closeness coupled with the common hardships of the long journey, produced conflict. 
If a person tended to be selfish or quarrelsome, these traits were certain to be brought out. Yet they drew strength from this nearness in time of need. The frequency of death made reference to it almost casual. Each day, an ox or mule collapsed in harness. Men wandered off and were never seen again. A wife or child fell to the sudden blow of cholera or fell beneath an iron-rimmed wheel. Firearms accidentally discharged in jolting wagons. All were mentioned with monotonous regularity. Amen. However, of the 300,000 who began the long trek, 90% made it. Wagons were driven over fresh graves to help destroy the scent and keep wild animals from digging up the remains. Names and dates were scratched into every available surface. Most etchings quickly eroded, but at Register Cliff, indelible signatures told all who passed by, I was here, and if only in a small way, have left my mark on this world. Recorded, too, are the marks of the wagons themselves. At times, the roadway channeled into a single pair of ruts, deeply pounded into the rocky earth by a stream of iron-rimmed wheels. Warm Springs was nicknamed the Laundry Tub. We spent an extra day there tidying up. <laughs> Wash days were few and far between. Clean clothes just weren't a trademark of the trail. High and lofty, Laramie Peak crowned the Laramie Mountains, a stately range which anxious travelers often mistook for the Rockies. Near the Red Buttes, the emigrants caught their last glimpse of the Platte. They had followed this unique river 500 miles. Indians called it Nebraska, land of shallow waters. Early French trappers named it the Platte, a French word meaning flat water. Much of the time it looked like a small creek without banks, lying on top of the earth. Yet this sad, miserable, nothing of a river spread a long green strip through an empty wasteland, a lifeline of grass and water invaluable to the western migration. Now the trail led toward a massive stone outcropping on the barren plain. Here there were no alternatives. All who traveled west had to pass Independence Rock, the most famous landmark on the trail. Camped in the shadow of the rock, early fur traders celebrated the 4th of July here by christening the rock Independence. It was an easy climb, and on top, we had a full view of the surrounding country. Four miles to the west of Independence Rock, the Sweetwater River cut a V-shaped rift through a granite ridge, Devil's Gate. I remember when a young girl of 18 fell from the top of the ridge. We buried her in the gorge, and someone wrote an epitaph. It was fitting. Here lies the body of Caroline Todd, whose soul has lately gone to God. Here redemption was too late. She was redeemed at Devil's Gate. The ragged eye of split rock watched over each caravan for days. This silent sentinel in the Rattlesnake Hills observed while wagon trains crossed and recrossed the Sweetwater. Between Split Rock and South Pass, the climate became arid and the ground sterile. One exception was a small oasis in the form of a grassy swamp, the Ice Slough, 
a natural peat bog insulated winter ice and preserved it throughout the warm summer months. We dug down 18 inches and came to a bed of solid, clear ice. We put some in water kegs and enjoyed the luxury of ice water all that hot day as we approached famous South Pass. South Pass, a broad 20-mile saddle in the Rocky Mountains, was usually a disappointment. Heck, if you didn't know it was a mountain pass, you wouldn't know it from any other place. The Oregon Buttes to the south, the jagged, snow-capped Wind River Range to the north. Yet, not until they actually saw water flowing west toward the Pacific Ocean, could the emigrants believe they had crossed the backbone of the continent. They had come 1,000 miles over trackless wastes and through rivers deep and wide. For two months they had endured burning sun and drenching rain. Some had not made it this far, but those who had were halfway to Oregon. Prominently located on the east bank of the Mississippi, the city of Nauvoo had prospered to become the largest in the state of Illinois. It was the headquarters and gathering place for the Church of Latter-day Saints. In 1844, Joseph Smith, founder and leader of the church, announced that he was a candidate for President of the United States. But political and religious violence erupted. Smith was jailed on a charge of treason and murdered by an armed mob. Two restless years elapsed before the Lion of the Lord Brigham Young led a portion of the saints on a wintry exodus across the frozen Mississippi, initiating one of the most astounding folk movements in history. By the late 1840s, hundreds of Mormon families had joined the throngs plodding westward on the Oregon Trail. First by wagon and later by handcart, the saints fled violence and followed prophecy to a new homeland in a valley of the Rocky Mountains. They crossed South Pass, forded the Little Sandy, and pursued the well-watered route to Fort Bridger. Jim Bridger had built a small trading post at the Black's Fork of the Green River. It marked the spot where the Mormon Trail branched off and headed for the valley of the Great Salt Lake. Sublette's cutoff became popular when the 49ers traded Oregon fever for gold fever. Impatient and in a hurry, great hordes of gold seekers took the parched, non-stop, 50-mile run for the Green River. We saved three days by taking the cutoff and then joined up with the Fort Bridger route at the Bear River. Wagons fanned out for miles over this broad river valley all the way to Soda Springs. There were miniature geysers and bubbly springs, and all of them had the stingy taste of soda water. <laughs> I remember one old fellow with a vivid imagination. He claimed it made a good lemonade when mixed with sugar and syrup. Approximately one week after leaving Soda Springs, the emigrants arrived at Fort Hall. Owned by the Hudson's Bay Company of England, this whitewashed bastion on the plain had its heyday early. The decline of the fur trade spelled ruin. By 1853, it was completely abandoned. Near Fort Hall, the emigrants encountered a river that early French trappers called accursed and mad. Deceptive calm would suddenly transform into a maze of rapids and foaming white water. For 200 miles through rock and desert, covered wagon trains twisted along a river so crooked it was called the Snake. Perpendicular canyon walls denied thirsty men and beasts a drink. 
The surrounding country is rough, broken and destitute of grass. Indeed, a land of fracture, violence, and fire. Yet this harshness was interrupted by a stunning and irresistible array of waterfalls. Mosquito country before, but I confess I never saw them in all their glory. They were so thick you could reach out and grab a hand. Flowing for miles beneath a lava landscape, an underground river burst from the canyon walls above the snake into a thousand springs. Three islands provided easy stepping stones as caravans cautiously threaded their way across the dangerous snake. The toughest going was at the western end. Your feet got heavy and began to drag. Clouds of alkali dust stung your eyes, and the alkali in the ground poisoned the water. The dry air shrunk wagon wheels, and without no warning, the rims rolled off. Even wagon tongues snapped. The heavens above were brass and earth was smoking iron beneath your feet. Everywhere the stench of bruised sage. At Farewell Bend, emigrants took their last look at the snake. The threatening river was exchanged for the ominous Blue Mountains. Looming high on the western horizon, their distinguished peaks seemed a resting place for the clouds. While the emigrants observed in awe, they remembered the grim warning. An early blizzard would be fatal. These mountains were the final dumping grounds for coveted pieces of furniture that formed the elegant litter found all along the route. Relics of colonial times that had crossed the Alleghenies and made it to the western frontier could not survive the Oregon Trail. In contrast to the long pull and the constant threat of snow, our spirits were renewed by sparkling streams of pure water and the cool shade of the first forest since leaving Missouri. Now, rolling hills descended into the valley of the Columbia. Emigrants knew this river flowed past the Cascade Mountains and emptied into the Pacific. The goal was now within reach. The Dalles, a small Methodist mission, marked the end of the wagon trail. From here, emigrants floated downstream to Fort Vancouver on wooden rafts. In 1845, however, Sam Barlow insisted that God never made a mountain without leaving a pass through it. He proved it by gouging a wagon road past the snow-capped cone of Mount Hood and into the valley of the Willamette River. The raft trip was a pleasant contrast to the dusty trail, except when the old river, tumbling through rocky lava beds, picked up the small rafts and overturned them. Beyond Beacon Rock, waters calmed, and dangling waterfalls charmed the eye on the way to Fort Vancouver. Fort Vancouver was the major supply base for the Hudson's Bay Company. The first emigrants arrived tired, hungry, and with few provisions. Dr. John McLaughlin, commander of the fort, provided supplies and extended credit to the impoverished travelers. Ironically, this generosity of McLaughlin, a British subject, helped to secure Oregon for the United States. 
Oregon's destiny was now manifest. The roots of an empire were beginning to grow. An empire that would soon leapfrog the continent and claim both coasts. The tracks that brought people west were exchanged for tracks that kept them there. In the 1870s, new tracks would begin to bring people west by the tens of thousands. And what was once vital and important became the victim of neglect and decay. Spectacular falls were replaced by dams and powerhouses. Small settlements grew into large towns and cities. Yet, for a short moment in history, like the shadow of a passing cloud on the face of time, an incredible 2,000-mile journey by foot and wagon made its mark. It was the first wagon road to span the continent and remembered as the Oregon Trail. William H. Russell, one of the most colorful businessmen on the American frontier. High-spirited and a bit reckless, Russell had a flair for doing things on a grand scale. Alexander Majors, conservative, devout. His word was as good as his signature. Over the years, Majors had gained a reputation as the best freighter in the West. William B. Waddell, a man with keen business ability, but cautious by nature. Waddell was not inclined to gamble. In April 1860, the firm of Russell, Majors, and Waddell launched a cross-country mail service. The mail was carried on horseback, carried faster than ever before. It was carried by the Pony Express. In 1850, California becomes the 31st state. But in 1850, 2,000 miles separate California from the other states. 2,000 miles of wilderness. The gold rush of 1849 had brought thousands to California. Now these new citizens are demanding a regular mail service to link them with the rest of the country. Mail service in the 1850s is slow, irregular, and expensive. Letters carried by wagon trains take months to cross the continent. Some letters never arrive at all. Ocean steamers hired by the government transport the bulk of the mail. The sea route, including a 50-mile trek through the jungles of Panama, takes about six weeks for delivery. But the schedules of the Pacific Mail Steamship Line are most unreliable. Attempting to improve mail service, the government experiments with mules, pack horses, even camels. None prove successful. Finally, the Post Office Department awards a six-year contract to the Butterfield Overland Mail Company a company formed by the merger of the Adams, American, National, and Wells Fargo Express companies. By 1858, Butterfield stages are relaying back and forth along the Southern, or Oxbow route. This route forms a long, flat semicircle between St. Louis and Memphis to the east and San Francisco on the west. 
but promoters of the central route claim this passage west is more direct and therefore faster. It follows the old Oregon and California trails. Shorter, yes, but mail carriers are troubled by winter storms and Indian raids. During 1859, several unrelated events draw attention to the central route. The question of slavery has brought the nation to the brink of civil war. Both the North and the South want California's wealth and its growing population. The South has access to California along the Butterfield route. The North must maintain the central route. The Pikes Peak Gold Rush. The Comstock Load. Fortune seekers again pack up their belongings and hurry west over the central route. Trains have crossed the state of Missouri and there are plans to lay track all the way to the Pacific Ocean. The South favors the southern route. The North argues for the central route. In 1859, one more factor promotes the central route. California is still demanding faster mail service. Lexington, Missouri was a busy trade center on the western frontier. Here, in 1851, two successful businessmen, William Russell and William Waddell, became partners and began delivering supplies to United States Army forts. Alexander Majors was a modest farmer. In 1848, he sold his farm, bought six wagons, and began hauling freight on the Santa Fe Trail. Six years later, he owned and operated the largest freight company in the West. In 1855, Majors became a business partner of Russell and Waddell. In this new firm, Russell was responsible for obtaining contracts. Majors was the field boss in charge of operations. Waddell was the money man, the financier. Within two years, this company had established a monopoly on all military trade west of the Missouri River. In 1859, they bought out the independent mail carriers struggling along the central route and formed the Central Overland California and Pikes Peak Express Company. January, 1860. With encouragement from California Senator William Gwynn, Russell decides to gamble. By demonstrating reliable mail service over the Central Route, he hopes to secure a government mail contract worth a million dollars. To help accomplish this, he wants something spectacular something that will capture the public's imagination. At first, Majors and Waddell balk. Other investments have put the freighting company deeply in debt. Russell, however, confident of the government mail contract, persuades them to carry out the project. I do hereby swear before the great and living God that while I am an employee of Russell, Majors, and Waddell, I will on no circumstances use profane language, that I will drink no intoxicating liquors, that I will not quarrel or fight with any other employee of the firm, and that in every respect I will conduct myself honestly, be faithful to my duties, and so direct all my acts as in the confidence of my employers. So help, so help me God. God. For private enterprise, it is an enormous undertaking. 500 horses are purchased, young, sturdy, swift, and built for endurance. St. Joseph, Missouri is selected as the Eastern Terminal. It is the first town on the Missouri River reached by both telegraph and railroad. Sacramento, California is designated the western end of the run. 
along the 2,000-mile route, the company establishes over 150 stations. Relay stations are located every 10 to 15 miles. These stations are small shelters where riders will be allowed two minutes to change horses. Home stations are located every 50 to 75 miles. At these larger stations, fresh riders will take over. Letters, wrapped in oil silk to prevent weather damage, will be carried in the pouches of a specially designed saddle cover called a mochila. Most letters will cost somewhere between five and ten dollars. The operators know this postage will not cover expenses. They must have the million dollar government mail subsidy. Meanwhile, Congress appropriates funds to continue the Overland Telegraph to California. April 3rd, 1860. Riders and their horses are ready, waiting. A special train speeds the mail to St. Joseph. After a brief celebration, the first messenger crosses the Missouri River and rides west. A rousing send-off in San Francisco, a boat ride to Sacramento, and the pony rider heads east like a phantom in the night. later, the last two couriers reach St. Joseph and San Francisco. Butterfield's time is cut in half. The whole country celebrates. Except for Native Americans, who fear their land will soon be taken. In late May, Paiute Indians kill one rider and several station attendants. Horses are driven off. Stations are burned. After two months of operation, Major shuts down the Pony Express. Six weeks pass before the uprising is crushed. Losses are severe. 150 horses, seven stations, 16 men killed. This is a devastating setback to a firm already in financial difficulty. Yet, when regular service resumes in July, Russell, in a desperate attempt to obtain the government contract, increases the once-a-week delivery schedule to twice a week. Everything depends upon political favor in Washington. But Congress, distracted by a national election and the threat of civil war, fails to act. Russell, still expecting a miracle, continues to borrow heavily. Majors and Waddell prophesy doom. November 1860. Telegraph lines now extend as far west as Fort Kearney, as far east as Fort Churchill. For the Pony Express, winter storms stretch the average delivery time to 15 days. In December, a political storm breaks in Washington. Russell is implicated in a bond scandal involving misappropriated government funds. Charges against Russell are dropped, but his name remains tarnished. February 1861. Texas militia cut operations on the southern route. Now Congress transfers the Butterfield Overland Mail Company to the central route and gives it the million-dollar contract. Under this contract, 
Russell's firm will be paid almost one half of a million dollars to operate the Pony Express from St. Joseph to Salt Lake City. But it is too little and too late. The transportation empire of Russell, Majors, and Waddell is at the mercy of its creditors. The Overland Mail Company operates the Pony Express until late October. When the telegraph becomes transcontinental, the need for fast mail service is over. During its short lifespan of 19 months, the Pony Express provided efficient and reliable mail service over the central route. It kept alive a northern tie with California at a crucial time, and it made a national hero of the pony rider. No conquering hero of Venice or Rome, rich laden with spoils for his city and home, and returning with honor, the darling of fame was ever accorded more royal acclaim. By the wealthy, the poor, the wise, and the clown, than I, on attaining the streets of this town. For I have come through to the end of the trail, and I have delivered the government mail. Russell, Majors, Waddell. Though touched by fame, their lives quickly passed into obscurity. Years later, each would be remembered and honored for their cross-country mail service, their short-lived bankrupt mail service that became a legend.